uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I know this is not a normal day, um, but you guys figured it out. So. Uh, anyway, how many of you, it's your first time on mobile board? Uh, more regulars this time. Jason, you just raise your hand. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so we're about mobile, um, about anything about mobile. Uh, we usually meet the fourth Monday of the month, but we figured that uh, nobody would show up on Memorial Day. Um, it's Monday because of an international organization called Mobile Mondays, um, although we're not actually affiliated with it. Uh, we have a website, mobileportland.com. There's a uh, Google group. That one is for basically just announcements about the monthly meetings. I'm sorry, there's a mailing list that's on mobileportland.com that's about the monthly meetings. The Google group is for uh, sort of discussions about whatever you want to talk about with other people that are in the group. So upcoming events, uh, tonight we've got Winter Devices Red as Hell. Next month we're back on our regular schedule, the 25th. We have Open Source Bridge coming up at the end of June, and OzCon in July. Depending on who's coming to OzCon, we may move the July meeting to coincide with that. Um, so uh, if your group is not on here and um, you think it should be, uh, let me know. Um, so we've got, th these are just developer groups, but there might be other mobile related groups that I just don't know about, so let me know. Uh, so there's Android Enthusiasts, Second Monday, they rotate, rotate between some of the lucky labs. Uh, Coco Heads is the fourth Wednesday, and uh, you can't be apparently an iOS developer and a JavaScript developer and go to their meetings, because Portland JavaScript admirers is on the same night. So, thank you to our sponsors, um, Urban Airship and Cloud4. Is there anybody from Urban Airship here who'd like to talk about cloud openings or anything like that? No? Jason, do you want to say anything? Uh, Urban Airship, sorry, I think I should go work for them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming they're hiring. I actually haven't looked recently, but every time I look, they're hiring. So yeah, I'm pretty they're sure growing, they're hiring. They're growing so much, they're kicking us out of our space. So. They probably have a lot of jobs posted. But anyway, tonight our speaker is Ken Weston. He's the founder of Gadget Track, and um, this should be really, really interesting. Hopefully, he doesn't reveal anything about me. Uh, so, welcome to Ken. Um, and we've learned a lot along the way. 
um, not just about our technology, but also other tracking technologies that uh, can be used against you or for you. Um, the government uses it, um, even retailers can use some of this technology. Um, so I figured it'd be a good presentation to sort of cover um, what we do um, and uh, the technology as well through a few of our case studies. Um, usually when I explain uh, what we do, uh, people usually assume that uh, this is me. <laughs> I'm the, uh, the gadget bounty hunter. Um, but I think a better way to kind of explain what we do is um, to show some of our recoveries. Uh, last weekend we actually had a laptop recovery that was covered um, actually in the Albuquerque, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and it was actually covered by the news, so I, I went ahead and I grabbed it from their website. And you can watch this. The laptop computer is stolen. The chance of getting it back is next to nil. It is a big world out there. But tonight, a local man is getting a stolen laptop back after it took a picture of the thief and then emailed it to him. Foreign your side reporter Mike Daniels is in the newsroom to show us how that happened. Mike? Tom and Nicole, here is the picture. 24-year-old Diego Torres. Police believe he is the one that ended up with the stolen computer. Detectives say they were able to catch up with him and the laptop because of some pre-installed tracking software that the victim had installed. This isn't the first time Chris Ortiz's mom's northeast Albuquerque home has been burglarized. The scene was devastated, actually this is the second time in three years. On Tuesday, the burglar or burglars got away with over $4,000 worth of stuff, including an HP laptop. But this time, Ortiz outsmarted the thief. And so as I was driving here, I remember that I had installed tracking software on a laptop. So when I got to the house, I activated the software. This great tracking software is called Gadget Track. After it's remotely activated, every time the laptop is open, it takes a picture. It's emailed to the rightful owner. Sure enough, yesterday. So after a couple times of him opening, I was able to see his house, his bedrooms, and I got a photo of the guy himself. It's smart. It also tracks the laptop's location using the Wi-Fi signal the computer is using. Police say the tracking software led them here to this house on the 300 block of 55th Street in Northwest Albuquerque. Police say the man in the computer snapshot is 24-year-old Diego Torres. When officers went to the house, his father confirmed there was Torres in the photo, but he wasn't there. It's unclear if Torres was the burglar. However, he is suspected of receiving the stolen laptop. Mom well, just not able to help him give him the information. I don't actually care about the laptop. I'm not going to place one. I'd have my mom get her jewelry back that she got in my family, jewelry, and things. Tonight, he went out to talk to Torres, but he wasn't there. We asked his father to have him call us. So, as you can see, usually when we go in to recover a stolen laptop, we don't just recover that laptop. We usually recover other stolen property, such as jewelry, which is something that can't be replaced. Um, we also um, have um, unveiled large organized theft rings. Um, we've solved other crimes, including um, car theft, identity theft, drugs. Um, yeah, even a violent carjacking that occurred in Brazil, we actually able to track down the suspects there as well. Um, so as you can imagine, we have a lot of interesting stories. Um, so, you know, I kept thinking about how everything connects, because a lot of times we don't just um, track down the device, but we actually end up doing a lot of other um, searches. We look for social media. We learn a lot about the suspects that we have um, when we're working on these cases. And I started looking at um, forensics um, and sort of how what we're doing can actually apply um, to forensic as a science. And I came across this guy named Edmund Lacar. Um, he's basically the grandfather of forensic science. Um, he's a French guy, born in the 20th century. Um, and uh, he had this concept that basically every, every contact needs a trace. Of course, he was dealing more with things like homicide, right? When, when you come in and you murder someone, something's always left behind, right? Such as DNA or um, a, foot, a fingerprint or some hair follicles. Um, so this is what he was getting at. However, this applies to the digital world as well. Even more so as everything becomes more and more connected, I'm finding that there's always a trace, there's always evidence. It's just a matter of where you look for it. So what I like to sort of categorize data into three different um, sort of tiers. The first tier is lucid data. So this is things like email, SMS, um, it can be calendars, your social posts, maybe interacting with a calendar. I call it loose because this is data that you're conscious of. This is information that you're fully aware of, and more importantly, you have control over. You can delete this information, you can remove it, um, you know exactly where it is at all times, and you're aware that you're actually posting this information out to the public. Uh, the next tier is not so straightforward. It's what I like to call peripheral data. 
So this is data that we, we can't necessarily see. It's usually device generated, but, more, but we're still aware that it exists. Um, we know that we're being tracked. We know there's Google Analytics. Um, we know our, we have our browser history. We know there's voicemail and there's some logs we generate with some of our activities. But more importantly, we know that this is this still um, is something we have control over. We can clear our, our cache. We can clear our history. We can clear all this information. We're fully aware that this exists, even though we can't see it at all times. There's a third tier, which is hidden data. Um, this is a little. Um, it, it gets a little dark here. Um, there's the metadata that's associated with files. There's um, device IDs um, that can uniquely identify the device as well as you. Um, there's overzealous tracking. So we talk about Google Analytics, but there's also things we can do that um, may be a little invasive. Um, you probably heard some of us um, these types of stories in the news. Um, error logging, um, you can actually um, do some sort of hacking things where we can get your location by logging errors. Um, aggregated data. So it's one thing to have data that's on your device. But if that, if that information gets put out into the cloud, can it, if it's shared with other application developers, we can start to create this sort of profile about you and um, what you're doing in your activities. Um, hidden log files, a lot of applications are actually logging information that maybe they shouldn't be logging. Um, and again, this information is being uploaded. And, and a few times they've actually been caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Um, I'll do another video here that kind of talks a little bit about that. your money. Here's News Channel 8 business reporter, Joe Smith. Good evening, Laurel. A member of Congress, the ACLU, and privacy watchdogs, they all want answers from Apple about why iPhones and iPads are collecting location data from users. It comes on the heels of a discovery in the United Kingdom that Apple is keeping track of your every move without you knowing it. I've been through Portland, all the way down to where my house lives. Ken Weston knows something about where things are. His company, ActiveTrack, can find lost computers and cell phones. But even he was surprised to learn Apple is tracking where he's been. It's pretty amazing man, that they actually found that this information was being stored on the phone, um, basically without the user's consent. Um, so you can actually go in and you can see the history of where that person's been. The hidden file was found on the latest version of the iPhone and iPad's operating systems. It contains unprotected data showing geographic movement using locations and timestamps. Just in general, it's kind of a creepy idea that someone just knows where you are at all times, especially when you go home, that kind of thing. All cell phones contain technology which can pinpoint a user's location, and many smartphone users already voluntarily give up their location by downloading various apps. It's fine if you know that, but I think it's unfortunate if people don't know that, and you know, oftentimes that can be used for good or evil in later cases. It has the ACLU concerned about the bigger picture of privacy and cell phones. There's going to be more of this technology in the coming years. And that's why ACLU has been pushing for privacy safeguards to be put into the law. Some experts speculate Apple might use the data for advertising purposes. And right now, there's no way to delete the information. No, uh, not right now. You're going to have to wait for an update. But what you can do is, is encrypt your backups. Unencrypted files transferred to your computer can be a security risk, especially if your laptop or iPhone is lost or stolen. Uh, I think that's where the real problem here is. Today, Minnesota Senator Al Franken sent a letter to Apple Steve Jobs, along with a list of questions he wants answered. So Apple wasn't really doing anything malicious with uh, that. <clears throat> what they were actually doing is trying to increase the accuracy of their own location services. Um, there's been other companies such as Google, another one called Skybook, um, that actually goes out and maps Wi-Fi networks and they're able to get location information. Um, they usually have a, a car that drives around and they can get that data. So what they did, and actually um, Android does this as well, is they actually went out and they get GPS coordinates and then they map the Wi-Fi networks in your area as well as the cell towers. When they do this, it helps increase the, the accuracy of their systems. But then again, should they really be doing this? Is this something that they maybe should have told their users about? Yes. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of why they got caught, and that's why people get a little leery about that. They're a little uncomfortable that um, their information is being tracked. Um, so when we talk about devices, um, we talk about um, device IDs. This is um, how a device can be uniquely identified. An IP address, it can give you the country, state, city, even the organization. Um, we can also get um, subscriber information. If the law enforcement they have a court order or a subpoena, they can actually go and they can get information, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we have the INEI, which is the International uh, Mobile um, Equipment Identifier. It actually uniquely identifies your device. And actually in that, there's some numbers where you can get the make, model, carrier, and even the country of where that device was sold. 
Um, then we have the IMSI, which actually is unique and is tied to your SIM card or uh, the device itself, where it actually identifies the country, carrier, um, unique ID, and some subscriber information as well. Just like an IP address can be mapped to a user, an IMEI and an IMSI can be mapped to a user as well. Um, then we have the UDID, which is you know, specific to the iPhone. Um, as a program, you can't get access to the IMEI number, but Apple has been using this UDID, and actually this is something that Apple um, is uh, moving away from. Uh, you can no longer access that um, or use it to uniquely identify a device. <coughs> um, then we have a MAC address, which is, um, you know, it, it identifies um, you know, either a card or a wireless card. Um, it actually can provide location information if it's your router. Um, then we also have serial numbers, of course, and usernames. Then of course we have files, uh, which we have uh, caches. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the tiles, when you go and look at your phone, the tiles that are on your phone are actually cached on, on the device itself. If someone gets access to that information, they can actually run it on some special software, and they can pull that out and see where you've been looking and where you've been. Um, there's also metadata. I mean, images, there's a thing called exit data. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's exchangeable image format. Um, there's a lot of data that's available in that that talks about where the device was taken. Sometimes if it's a cell phone, that's where the, the geolocation data is stored. Um, there's also some serial numbers for some devices as well. Um, we'll also have um, some access control paths. Um, then we have logs, of course, which has location, cell towers. That's sort of what we saw with the iPhone. All the information was in log files. Um, and some of those are hidden, some of them aren't. Um, and then, of course, we have file changes. If a device gets, or a file gets modified, uh, we'll be able to identify, identify that. And then, of course, hardware. We have um, laptops. I don't think any laptop nowadays comes without a, a web camera. Um, that can be used for tracking, as you can see in some of our recovery stories. Um, we can also you know, have GPS, so pretty much every cell phone has a GPS in it. Um, and that can be used to identify your location. Um, and if it doesn't, we can actually get location off of Wi-Fi networks as well. A laptop doesn't have GPS, but we can still tell you where that device is within 10 to 20 meters of accuracy. And also, even a printer. When you print out uh, a piece of paper or uh, print out a worksheet or something like that, um, there's actually tiny little dots that are actually printed, through little yellow tiny dots, that will actually identify um, the serial number and the make and model of the printer that I was taking. Uh, a little scary, uh, but that was done so um, they could identify counterfeiters and things like that. However, um, that can also be used for malicious purposes as well. So we're talking about two locations. So I actually mapped out, you probably can't see it's kind of dark, but I mapped out um, all the devices that connect, that all our customers, that, that connect to our system over the like, I think about 48 hours. Um, it's kind of pretty. Uh, but you see there's concentrations in cities and things like that. There's a lot of information that you can actually gather from that. So when you talk about location, we, the first thing you want to look at is IP address. We can actually tell city. If you Google Analytics, other analytics services, this is how they get location of your customers. They can get it down to the city level. Um, that's, that's, that's okay, that's great. Um, but what if we want to get more granular? We can do cell tower triangulation if it's a cell phone. Um, with cell tower triangulation, you're going to get within 200 to 1,000 meters. Still, um, that's not going to be very good for theft recovery or identifying specifically where someone is. So then we move into Wi-Fi positioning. Now this is, will work really well in denser environments, it works indoors. Um, and it's, it's great in the city, but not so much in an urban area where there's not a lot of Wi-Fi networks and things like that. You need a lot of Wi-Fi routers that can be sniffed um, to get the location, but this is something we've used um, with a lot of um, success um, for recovering stolen laptops. And again, it gets within 10 to 20 meters. Then of course we have GPS. GPS is great when you can get a signal. Problem is cell phones, they have a really crappy chip in them um, to conserve the energy. They don't work indoors. They have a really big problem in, in dense urban environments where buildings are in the way. Um, so if you can get a signal, that's great. Um, but um, Wi-Fi positioning is usually better because it does work indoors. Usually when someone steals a device, they're not out showing it off. They're going to be indoors. Um, and so that's where um, we rely really uh, quite a bit on that. So we talk about um, how law enforcement can get information from your IP address or from the unique IDs on your phone. Um, it's not something that's very easy. A lot of theft recovery products relied on IP address, um, but this is a process that can take uh, weeks to months. It really depends on the carrier or the ISP. Um, there's actually a hierarchy that law enforcement has to follow. Um, if they want to get just transaction records, so your name, billing, uh, maybe your phone numbers, um, they are going to have to do a subpoena. And they have to have a judge sign this, they have to have a probable cause, and then they'll be able to go out and look. That's all the information they're going to be able to get. 
If they want more information, such as the numbers that you've dialed, incoming and outgoing, they're going to have to get a court order. And again, they're going to have to have probable cause um, and actually tell the judge why they need that specific information. Um, same thing with location data. Um, it's all sort of this hierarchy. And the last one is content of conversations. To get a wiretap, for example, they're going to have to have and prove um, you know, that they have a valid reason to actually get that information more so than any of the other, other tiers. So sometimes uh, law enforcement, they develop technology that tries to go in the gray areas, something that they won't necessarily have to get a court order for. Um, what if they have some technology that really there's no law in the books for? Um, a good example are these things called Stingray devices. Um, these are devices where basically um, it's a little product or a little box. It pretends and actually mimics that it's a cell tower. It gets, um, basically tricks your cell phone to think that it's a cell tower and sends information to that device. They will drive that van around a block and from that they'll actually be able to triangulate your location. Right? This is some pretty scary stuff. They actually got a hacker doing this. Um, and as a result of that, they try to get some of this information out in the public and it comes to find out they've been using this for, for quite a bit. Uh, quite a while actually. Uh, and now there's starting to be some, some laws that are actually catching up with the, the technology. But uh, it doesn't stop there. There's even I have a side, I, I side catching at the mall. So there's actually these companies, um, their path intelligence will actually go out, um, they put these little stations in a mall, um, and they'll actually be able to, be able to identify um, where people are. Um, this is a little um, grayer, there was a lot of um, uh, people that were upset by this the fact, when they found out that they were doing this. Um, they did this in a U.S. mall and they quickly um, shut that thing down. Um, but it's, it's pretty slick technology actually, being able to identify where people are actually in a building by uh, setting up these little cell towers. Um, it's, it's pretty cool, but also very really illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to, you can build your own. Um, it's, uh, basically, there's uh, open source software out there called OpenBTS um, that allow you to create this uh, technology. Um, it's simply grab a box, it's a universal software peripheral uh, device, and um, here's some websites where you can actually go out and get some information from it. I highly recommend this one, The Well-Tempered Hacker. He has some nice YouTube videos that walks through how to go about doing that. Yes? Why was the previous one illegal? Was it the police doing it, or did the mall do it? Then it's a gray area. Well, the, it was done by the mall, um, and it's this, this company that they created it, and there was marketing. Are, it was marketing. If you made a purchase in one store, they would send you a coupon to know that you're still in the mall and say, hey, come to my store. That's what they were doing. And well, the one that I saw was they were actually going just, right. just seeing what people were going in the mall. Um, and actually, have. If you go to the website, you can see um, some of the things that are. It wasn't necessarily coupons and things like that. It was actually running a survey. So, um, but the fact is they're catching your radio the radio frequency. Um, so there's some weird things that happen there. Um, it's, it's not necessarily legal, but it's, it's really starting to cross the line. And as a result of this, there's been a lot of upset about this and um, actually some, some research going into actually setting laws and limiting what retail people can do in terms of this technology. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Does this apply only to local governments or is that federal government? I'm sorry? Does this apply only to local governments? The, the laws? Or um, well, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to sit here and tell all the, what the laws are, but uh, most of these are dealing with like FCC. I mean, there's, when you use this box, for example, there's um, if you turn it to a certain frequency and outside your house, you can get in some trouble. I'm um, actually even using that in your house, you can get in some trouble as well. Um, so just be cautious if you're going to be using this. And, and it's up to you to know about the laws. Okay, I'm not telling you to break any laws here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I have enough trouble. <laughs> um, so another example is, um, this was great. This was a, a really, uh, just really slick thing that happened um, in Black Hat last year. Um, these guys actually took the same technology, this, the cell tower, um, they loaded it up into their own little drone and they flew it around to show that they can actually intercept cell phone conversations. Um, they also had some things in there where it would actually connect to Wi-Fi networks and try to do penetration testing. Um, all kinds of really cool stuff that was happening they were able to do it remotely. Anyway, this guy's my hero. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing is um, images. Um, there's a lot of information we can actually get from images. Um, and of course, I have another recovery story to, uh, to illustrate that. It's helping track them down. News Channel 8's at Teach Out spent the past two days with police and investigators on the trail of swiped cell phones. He's live outside the Washington Square Mall with the theft took place at... Well, the managers of the Sprint store here at the Washington Square Mall behind me 
say they're very confident that tracking software developed only miles away from here and put onto their demo phones will lead to an arrest. Uh, this is a $500 phone. This ends up being a $450 phone. Two empty display cradles are all that remains after someone stole two demo cell phones from the Sprint store at Washington Square Mall on Saturday. Moments after surveillance video caught the theft on tape, employees initiated tracking software installed on the stolen phones. They were able to not only find the GPS location of the individuals that took them, uh, but also we've been able to, uh, to monitor any activity that happens in the phone. That activity conducted a picture someone took shortly after the phone was stolen. Tiger police admit that the was taken on cell phones to be told to send back pictures once they're stolen. And that has not only piqued the interest of our investigators, but in essence, uh, appears um, at this point could be very credible information for us to follow up on. The Portland creator of the software tracking the theft says police are on the right track. If they're not the thieves, they definitely know who's stolen. And if you look over the head of this man, you'll see in the window an Oregon temporary permit. Philip, this is it. With the help of a gadget track investigator on the phone, we tracked the stolen phone signal to this Vancouver apartment complex. There we found the exact temporary permit. <laughs> <laughs> had sent this photo to her Saturday evening, but says she knew nothing about the phones. Hi, I'm going to track the second cell phone signal to this duplex about eight blocks away. We don't have a, a, a Samsung Epic phone at this location? Uh, that's what we were yesterday looking for. Him. <laughs> we're back live now outside the Washington Square Mall where we've just obtained within the hour the DMV records on that. Yeah, so actually that case, um, they actually ended up uh, catching a theft ring. There were six people that actually were involved. Um, they actually recovered stolen vehicles as well. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, um, images can get you in trouble, right? Um, so here it was, um, boom! We, uh, we were able to get um, some extra information. Um, this happened too, one of our first recoveries that we ever had. Um, we actually had this, it was a tattoo shop owner. Um, he had a, a stolen uh, computer. Um, and we were able to see all the other stolen equipment that he had actually taken. <laughs> And then down here in the bottom, these are actually um, with one of our new products, Camera Trace. I actually went through and uh, it was a stolen camera. We were able to look at all the, the photos that were taken with the stolen camera. Um, we have some marijuana, um, an unregistered firearm, more marijuana, um, driving, uh, taking a photo, uh, smoking weed while you're driving, smoking weed while you're a passenger. Um, they also took a fit photo of their speedometer going 120 miles an hour. So. <laughs> So in addition to um, information that's actually in the photo that you can see visually, we also have what's called EXIF data. Um, so um, here I actually um, can get GPS coordinates from um, data that's actually embedded in the video. I don't have to get it from the phone itself. Um, this actually helped in this case, helped verify that the information we were gathering was correct. Um, and there's a lot of other information that actually gets embedded in there as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about EXIF data. Um, it's essentially metadata, it's in images, it's in video and audio as well. Um, in cell phones, they actually embed the GPS coordinates. That's where uh, the geolocation data is stored. Um, we also found that many digital cameras actually embed serial numbers, especially the high-end cameras. Um, and we decided to create a product around that. Um, we'll also get a timestamp. Um, I actually created an easy tool called Exif Scan. You can actually upload your photos, um, and it'll actually show you all the Exif data that's in that image. Um, if it has GPS coordinates, we'll even show you a map of where that uh, photo was taken. So one thing that I started looking at exit data was a case that happened about 2007. Um, a high school student posted a photo of pipe bombs um, on a website called 4chan. Uh, don't go to that website if you've never been there before. Um, <laughs> basically, um, he said that he was going to uh, set bombs in the school and him and several other folks were going to come in with automatic weapons. Um, and this type of activity is kind of frowned upon in our society after a few of these real cases that have actually happened. Um, thing is that uh, there was some information embedded in the image. Um, he had a, a camera that was to use where he actually could put the name of the person that owns it um, when you register and set up the camera, and it happened with the name of his father. Um, so it was great. Uh, they were able to actually get the name of the person. Uh, 410 actually did some good. And, um, the, here's a letter from the school explaining to the parents what happened. 
um, and nobody was hurt. Uh, of course, the kid was just messing around, but who knows, right? Uh, so it's a great thing. Um, XF metadata helps solve crime. And that's when we came up with the camera trace. Um, we found that a lot of like photo sharing websites like Flickr, even information that's on like, social media sites, um, that exit data still is in the, the images. The trick is trying to find it. Um, what happens when you have just billions of images? Flickr is like six, like seven or eight billion images right now. Um, and how can we actually go out and index that? So we wrote a special bot that actually goes out and does that. I partner with a, uh, a company I advise called CP Usage, um, where they have uh, basically hundreds of computers at their disposal. Um, I was able to send this um, job to all these, these machines and we're basically sort of like a botnet, right? And it was able to go out there and index and grab all this data. We actually scanned about six billion images over the course of two months, um, and then we had this huge database. And as a result of that, we actually had one of our first recoveries. But Another video. Now. The surprising player photographer tracked down his stolen camera, the web reacts to Steve Jobs' resignation from Apple, and the zoo animals predicted the earthquake. All right, well, it's cool. Well, anyway, we had a, it was a, basically, it was a uh, photographer. He had his camera stolen about a year ago, um, and he used our service. He found it a year later, um, and they were, they were able to actually go in and um, saw this, this other photographer post his equipment on Facebook. Um, the LAPD followed up on the, on the story, um, and they recovered $9,000 worth of equipment for him. Um, the camera was actually sold on eBay, um, and that person on eBay had, had bought it from someone on Craigslist. Um, and then when the police went in to the guy on Craigslist, they found all kinds of other stolen property. Um, so imagine his surprise when you find out that a camera you stole a year ago and you sold, and, and it was actually sold twice, um, can actually lead, still lead back to you. We've had quite a few of those ever since. Um, another example where exit data can get you in trouble, um, an anonymous hacker named Don Wormer, um, he was going in and hacking into um, law enforcement websites um, grabbing information about law enforcement agents and posting it online. Um, not too smart. Um, and as a result, um, he was uh, pretty much wanted uh, by a lot of different people. And um, he started posting a lot of information and he got really arrogant. He started posting photos. Um, this photo here is a screenshot of him actually using what's called a bot herder um, and an error that he had. Um, the bad thing is, is that he has a Skype ID right there that was visible. Um, he also had another username, um, Higocha. Um, which will be relevant later. Uh, we also put um, a bunch of photos of his, what looks like his girlfriend, um, saying how he pawned law enforcement. Um, the problem is, there was data embedded in that photo. Uh, police were able to track that down the FBI, they tracked it down to a house in Melbourne, and they were able to map that to a Kylie Gardner. That was enough for probable cause. They were able to go and um, get a court order for Facebook information where they actually found more photos. Um, they also found that um, she was in a relationship with a fellow on Facebook who had the handle of Get Listed Man. Um, this led them to unveil the hacker. Um, his name is Higeno Ucha, which matches the username, and um, he's in big trouble. <laughs> So as you can see, social media actually plays a role here as well. Um, we don't just recover data, we also recover a lot of other um, information. We do a little bit of research. Uh, one laptop that we had that was stolen, um, it was stolen as part of a burglary. We didn't get a connection for two weeks, and then all of a sudden we were getting connection in Missouri. So I kept getting photos of this guy. He was all over the place, McDonald's, hotels. Um, we were tracking him all over the place. We were trying to figure out how the heck did this happen. Um, he changed the username on the computer, which we were able to see in one of our reports. Uh, we did some searches and we found that he is a big eBay seller of uh, used vehicle parts. Um, uh, lots of uh, wheels, um, emblems, uh, bumpers. <laughs> and uh, he also posts a lot of stuff on Craigslist. And he really loves cars, particularly the ones that he works on, that he forgets to black out the license plate numbers. Um, so we were actually able to give this information um, to Missouri, the district attorney there, said even if he doesn't have a laptop, this is all enough information to actually bust him for possession of stolen equipment. So, so I did a little uh, recon here. <laughs> Grab some information from some folks. They actually gave me their uh, permission. Um, this is Ice Cream Man. Are you here? Sure. Here you go. 
you. So I got some information about you. You've been very busy the last few years. Um, although I, I also have, uh, <laughs> I also were able to get timestamps and some other information. I was able to give his address, um, his phone number as well. And I got another one. Uh, this was someone that was not very active on social media, but I did find out that where she had coffee this morning at Starbucks. Um, and then I'm also able to get a lot of other information, including address, age, um, a lot of other information from um, some other social media sites. So, um, and these tools that I use, um, they're available. One of them is called Creepy. Uh, <laughs> um, you can download it, um, you can put it in a Twitter handle, and it'll actually download all the information you can. Not just from Twitter. Twitter will only save uh, location information for about three months. Um, this is more of the photo sharing sites, like TwitPic, YFrog, and a bunch of other ones, where it'll actually store that information forever, because it has a photo. So this tool will actually download it, scan the exit data, and pull location data from it. Um, another one's Maltigo. Um, that one's a little more hardcore. It does have some social media components, but it'll also give you other information about email address. Um, it'll, it'll help you map um, DNS and IP. And a lot of the things that hackers might be interested in, or if you're a security expert, you want to do penetration testing because you're legal and legit. Um, that's a good tool for you. Another one's Rapidly. Um, it's a good tool for you for marketers as well. Um, you can upload a um, bunch of um, email addresses, and it'll give you all sorts of demographic data about that, about your list. Um, everything from how much they make, um, you know, to where they live, um, and a bunch of other really valuable data. So, um, kind of straight from the mobile stuff, I want to talk about just some other um, things that can be used against you. Um, closed caption television. We actually had a recovery um, early on with our flash drive where uh, we were getting the IP address. We worked with campus security and we found that it was coming from a particular uh, security computer lab. Sorry. It was a computer lab and there was a security camera that was in the entryway after they just had a bunch of computers that were stolen. Um, and there was also security card swipes. So as a result of the IP address getting us to the general location, the closed caption video and the, the security swipe, it was enough for us to get that flash drive back for our customer. Um, there are over 30 million security cameras in the U.S. Um, most of them have really crappy security. Uh, they're, they rent their own firmware. Um, they found that 70% of them still have the default passwords. These are IP cameras. There are certain ways you can search on Google and you can find where some of these cameras are. Um, and some of them have back doors, or so I've heard. <laughs> so another thing is facial recognition. Uh, this is something I've been really interested in, you know, with us cap capturing photos of people um, and their faces. <laughs> so facial recognition is actually being used by the Oregon Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, I don't know if anyone, has anyone got their license recently? Got a new license? You'll notice that it used to be that they would give you a license right there. Now they give you a temporary license. First thing they do when you get a, your photo taken is they run facial recognition software to make sure that the picture that is captured matches the face from your last license. If that's everything's okay there, they will then give you a temporary license. Then they will send your photo off to um, a main database where they will actually run scans of your uh, foot face to make sure it doesn't match any fraudsters. Um, if it does, they will actually send that to a fraud investigation and law enforcement will follow up. Um, what's really interesting is that law enforcement, FBI, um, even police, they cannot use the same system to, to track um, other crimes. So if they got a photo of a guy, like maybe they, a laptop that was stolen, they cannot use this system to go in and look for people. There's a law, it's the SP640, it limits law enforcement's ability to do that. Information can go from the DMV to law enforcement, but law enforcement cannot use this tool for any other purpose. It's interesting is that that's the only thing that's stopping this from being very invasive, is one little law. Um, the other one's Morris. This is um, getting really scary. It's basically um, a little mobile iPhone app with some hardware attached to it. It'll actually run retinal scans and facial recognition um, that's tied into a central database as well. Um, in Boston, I think they're using this right now. Um, so that's, that's getting a little uh, 1984 for me. Um, you can also do things like Google searches where you can actually do um, face only. If you put the image type equals face, and then you do Ken Weston, you'll see my beautiful face everywhere. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who does it. Yeah. So another one is license plate readers. Um, I've done a lot of research on this, especially after we had some cases where uh, license plates were in photos. Um, sorry, there's a lot of data here. I was going to bring this up in some other slides, but um, I found that you know one reader can actually scan about um, 1,800 plates, um, and it used to be that this was used for stolen vehicles only. 
Um, they would go out, they would scan maybe cars that are parking on the street or in a parking lot. They would match those to other vehicles that were stolen. What's happening though is that instead of just doing an initial scan, they're scanning those, putting a timestamp on it, and then it's being saved in, in the cloud. Um, so there's a massive repository of um, your uh, license plates. Um, so law enforcement likes to use this to then find out where people are at any given time. Um, it used to be that it's just devices that would be on the top of a, a cop car um, that can actually just scan vehicles as they pass them, that are behind them, um, it'll just keep scanning those. Um, now that we're finding that devices are actually being put stationary, so on I-5, for example, we'll be able to get a map of every vehicle that passes by. Um, so this stuff gets a little, a little bit scary. Um, I also found that you can buy your own, it's totally legal. Um, I might buy one for Christmas. Um, they're about 300 to $600. Um, there's even some um, um, apps, like an iPhone app, I think, that actually does it. I, I tested that one, it was really crappy, because you have to have a really good um, a camera to, to read it. Um, but uh, that's kind of where your, uh, some of this technology is going. And that's pretty much it, so any questions? So that we can hear on the video. So put your hand up. Security always tends to be a challenge in, in computing. Okay, so you have the laptops, and so forth. And my question deals with the wireless, or excuse me, the mobile community. How much of the mobile community versus the typical laptop community do you see embracing? Security. Well, um, I mean, it's one thing we found is that like laptops, people care about the value of the device. Um, as we move more into the enterprise, they care more about the value of the data. Um, so when we built our mobile products, we didn't just do tracking. Um, we also did some pretty strong encryption and backup of, the, of that data. Um, so we found that really on the mobile phone, people really care about the data because um, you know you can go get a new phone every two years. You know, it's, it's subsidized by the carrier. It doesn't cost you that much. Um, but that data is pretty much irreplaceable. Um, all your contacts and all, the, all your photos. Uh, we've had cases where people asked us, you know, hey, I didn't have your software on it, um, but I had like, you know, my, my kid's photos for the last, you know, three years since he was born, and my phone got stolen. Can you help me recover it? Um, you know, there's this thing called backup, <laughs> but uh, you know, people they don't think about it until it actually happens to them. Uh, regarding pictures and the exit data, if somebody were to pull a picture and sit on a laptop and take a screenshot of that and then use that screenshot image, would it still uh, maintain all the data? No. <laughs> like a quick fix for hackers. Hey again, thanks. Really interesting stuff. You had, you had talked recently about, or a couple years ago, about the differences between your ability to track phones on iOS versus Android. And I'm wondering if it's still as difficult to sort of provide the services that you do on iOS devices versus Android devices. I uh, yeah, like the first version of the uh, um, the iPhone we couldn't do a whole lot with. Um, we relied on social engineering. It's when you click on the app. Um, now we can actually do things where there's background processes. Um, we can hook into that. Um, significant location changes we hook into that as well. Um, so it's getting a lot easier, um, but still we can actually do a lot more on Android and Blackberry and the mobile platforms simply because we have deeper access. You can actually extend the functionality of the phone, um, whereas with you know the iPhone you're still kind of sandboxed into what you can do. Um, but it's good and bad. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of I think there's more invasive things you can do on Android as a result of that if you have um, malicious intent. Um, but yeah. Actually, uh, so apparently my paranoia by just putting post a note on my webcam doesn't really help me. Um, but second of all, how with this license plate reader stuff, um, is there any way that somebody can cross reference the public data, or as far as like EMB records, so if they just scan your license plate? And um, law enforcement can do that. But what's scary to me is that there's the information is actually gathered um, from both public and private means. If you look at the, the company's basic visual video, they say you know, these financial folks, they'll put up fleets of vehicles, and the financial folks, they're repo men, right? So they're actually having these cars, and they're, they're, they're driving into apartment complexes and scanning these. So there's actual private databases that are being generated, um, and that information has value. Um, and there's really no laws regulating that right now. 
Um, so imagine all the stuff that's sort of happening with phones, with tracking with your IMEI, that's going to happen with your vehicle. It's going to start happening, which you know, we like to refer to as meat space. That's going to start happening more and more, um, not just with you know, um, your phone itself, but also your vehicle and you know, other devices as they become more intelligent. So all of us here right now, with you presenting to us, what can we do to best protect ourselves against you know, all these invasive companies and or government? I mean, anybody just want to get our information? I think the best thing is, um, I mean, kind of what we're doing now, right? Uh, nerds need to hold people accountable. You know, we need to watch the watches. Um, like the thing with the iPhone tracking, um, one path recently, um, they were uploading all the contact information. Um, you know, they kind of got their hand caught in the cookie jar. Um, they were saying, well, everyone does this. And it's true, a lot of folks were doing it. Does it make it right? No. But immediately once that was, um, some security breaches actually raised awareness around that, they stopped doing it. So I think that's the trick, is that we're not going to be able to stop this, but if we come, become more aware of it, um, and you know, that affects our buying practices. Um, you know, a brand is really important to some of these mobile companies. And if people feel like they can't be trusted, it's going to have an impact on sales. It's going to have an impact on shareholders as well. So that's something to think about, especially with Facebook. Uh, hey there, Ken. Uh, a lot of product owner on it recommended always use it for all of your laptops. Uh, one of the things that occurs to me as this presentation goes on is uh, how much does Get to Track attract the attention of other not so positive forces in terms of your own collection of data about all their customers and all their devices and all their location data? Now, like most of the time, people aren't trained on tracking unless they're reporting it stolen, right? But some people probably are thinking, oh, I'm going to enable it, I'm going to turn on tracking right away. So they're basically advertising to your system their devices where they're located. How are you guys uh, making sure no one's getting into your stuff? to get all the customers. So, we, we plan that. Like, I, I, I have a tinfoil hat on most of the time. And that was with the design of our product. Is I found that the best way to secure your customers' data is don't store it. If you do store it, encrypt it in a way that not even you have access to it. Um, and that can be done with one-way hashes for passwords. Um, and if it's, you know, it's really it's the best, best practice. Unfortunately, even big companies that get multi-million dollars don't realize that. Um, how many times do we hear about a data breach where passwords were actually, like even Sony, um, plain text information was actually breached? Um, you know, this is a, a huge issue and people need to be aware of it. Um, when it came to time for us to back up information such as photos, um, your contacts, we did it in a way that you actually enter a privacy key. You will actually encrypt that information. That key is not stored in our database anywhere. Um, it's only known by you. You encrypt that, you set the key, your information gets encrypted before it gets transmitted to our servers. So if, for example, um, you have some photos on there that you, um, and the police come to us and they want that information, um, okay, go ahead, we're gonna need a, a court order for that, great, here's your data. It's a big blob of encrypted information. They're gonna have to go to you to get the key to decrypt that data, um, and this was all by design. I hope this isn't off topic, it's just something I've been thinking about for years. And it, it involves tracking, and all of these devices have are, are all powered. Have you run across any anything that is small, inexpensive, that runs off of no power or a long-term battery option? Because I could see that people, you know, as far as tracking when you don't have an actual device, but the ability to put that onto a car. I mean, yes, it's kind of sci-fi, James Bond, but you, have you run across much of that, or are there many issues regarding that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these, um, these, I don't know if you guys have seen these. A lot of vehicles are actually getting tracked by, um, by law enforcement, the FBI. Um, they're actually putting them on vehicles, and there was some weird legal stuff that happened here. Um, FBI, I believe they were doing it because it was in public space. Uh, they put it underneath the vehicle with magnets. Um, and it was all homegrown, so this is sort of what it looks like. It's powered by D batteries, um, and it's, it's pretty, you know, it's not exactly a polished product. Um, they're basically built, you know, as they need them. Um, but there are devices that get even smaller that you can put um, on devices used for tracking. Um, they're getting smaller and smaller, especially as batteries get more powerful. Um, I mean, you're seeing little Linux computers are, you know, about the size of a quarter now. Um, so it's only a matter of time before we find a way to do that via solar cells or something like that. So. It looks like that's it. Thank you, Ken. Thank you.
real quick, I uh, realized uh, that I blew right past uh, any announcements. Um, I know some people like to do that. So if anybody has job openings or anything else that they'd like to announce for the group, uh, now would be the time. I am uh, Mark Murphy, and I just want to let people know that there is a hackathon coming up uh, week from Saturday. It's called the Vibrant Data Hackathon. Uh, what we're doing is taking a look at what might come next after Web 2.0. So what would happen if all of us own our own data and control it and are able to extract a price from Facebook and Google? So hope to sign up. Okay, that looks like that's it. Uh, again, thank you to Ken, that was really interesting. And uh, keep in touch if you have any ideas for future topics or user groups uh, that we don't know about. Um, you know, let us know, and we'll see you in a month. Thanks for coming.